recording. Let me start a chat thing. And um, okay, so let's uh, let's see um, if somebody has uh, a question. Let's please type it on the chat. Um, uh, the chat page. Um, I thought I would um, say some things about Bessel functions. Um, first of all, um, uh, namely that when the problem involves large values of rho, then um, what you have to use is the Bessel functions of the second kind and the modified Bessel functions of the second kind. So those are the Ys and the Ks. And uh, the same thing is true uh, when you have Helmholtz's equation in the form of a diffusion equation. Um, uh, also, I've... I've moved stuff around. Um, I put the um, modified Bessel functions uh, in a more sensible place, namely before uh, that brief section of on Bessel functions of the third kind. And uh, I've, I've made a new uh, section called modified Bessel functions, essentially the same it's the same equations and, and sentences almost, which is a few changes of paragraphs and uh, so forth. Um, uh, the advantage is that it just makes a little more sense. And I may even move the Helmholtz equation section uh, to uh, a place that's right after the modified Bessel functions um, because the Helmholtz section refers to modified Bessel functions. Um, and also, um, if one wants uh, 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 to discuss um, Bessel functions that are finite uh, at uh, as rho goes to infinity, then you need Bessel functions of the second kind. So it makes sense to put the whole Helmholtz thing after that. And I think I'll do that uh, uh, later. Um, let me just mention that I've, I've postponed uh, the homework due yesterday until Saturday, and I've delayed the next two homeworks until the corresponding Wednesdays. Um, so I think that'll um, allow you all to relax over the um, Thanksgiving holiday and make up for the fact that um, my statement of this problem was... Um, incomplete i should have meant i should have um asked for five solutions rather than just three um i guess then that we can uh, go on to um whoops i don't know why it does that uh um, and in fact now i'm going to have to pull it back um Actually, though, I want to move this over here and this over there. So we, I, I don't even think we want that. And then we can make this a lot bigger so you guys can see it more easily. Uh, well, maybe I went a little too far here. Um, so I think um, I'll, I'll just sort of once again review some of the general relativity. Um, remember the basic thing is tensors. Tensors are things that transform simply under general coordinate transformations. You may wonder about my pinky. That's um, I'm a victim of bad medicine at UNMH. In fact, uh, a year or two ago, they nearly killed me. Um, 
anyhow, um, um, so uh, the simplest kinds of tenses are scalars that are simply invariant and then vectors that transform like derivatives or like coordinate differentials. Um, and the next important thing is the metric of space-time. This is the basic thing of general relativity. Um, most treatments of general relativity just say, well, we've got this invariant here, and um, they then define the Christoffel symbols in terms of the metric tensor and then define the covariant derivatives in terms of the Christoffel symbols. I think it makes more sense to say that our um, curved space-time is embedded in a flat Euclidean space-time. And in that Euclidean space-time, you have vectors of higher dimension, five, dimension five, maybe dimension 16, I don't know what dimension, but, um, uh, and the, the dot product of two, well, the basis vectors are, in other words, you've got, let me, let me maybe, first of all, let me get rid of this stupid uh, console. Um, and let me, okay, hold on. I've got to, there's this business of how you get the, how I get the, okay, tap to connect. Um, and now I go over here, and so I'm going to use red. Okay, so um, the idea here is then that our curved space-time lies in a um, flat space-time um, where all the vectors, uh, are the, you, you have a flat space-time of higher dimension. And... Um, if we now look at a uh, point, say, in our curved space-time, and it might correspond to, for example, um, co uh, coordinates that are, um, let me use these, the, I'll imagine that they're, these are the coordinates, it's this point here, like that. But of course, you'd need at least four coordinates to label this point. But then the idea is that if you change dx a little bit, then the change here in dp is going to be ei dxi. And so that the change in dx then uh, takes us um, in this direction, say, and it it's tangent to the surface, um, which then the surface is our curved space time. But um, once the change is no longer infinitesimal, but is macroscopic, then um, the vec you see that the vector isn't any longer on the curved um, uh, surface. Um, anyway, the the the, so this is the change in the point. And now if you take the dot product of uh, one dp for, of dp with itself, then you get here dp squared, which is the partial of the point with respect to the coordinates summed over the coordinate differentials. And then the same thing here, partial P with respect to XK, DXK. And e, the partials of the point are the tangent vectors, EI and EK. And you multiply them by DXI, DXK. Well, this inner product is the metric of space-time. And so, in other words, um, DP dot DP the dot being in the higher dimensional Euclidean or semi-Euclidean. Semi-Euclidean just means you have some time dimensions. This is then GIK, DXI, DXK, and uh, 
equivalently, it's EI dot EK uh, DXI DXK. So that's the point of view here. And I think it makes everything clearer and um, more sensible. Um, in terms of common notation, uh, dp squared, which is the invariant. Now, why is this invariant? Maybe I should just mention. The point here is that our curved space-time is physical, and it is what it is or does what it does, quite independent of our coordinates. So it's invariant. Our coordinates, we can use any set of coordinates. And the point is we have to be depending, describing the same space-time, no matter what coordinates we use. So the thing that's invariant is dp squared. And as we change our coordinates, the metric has to change to keep the thing that's physical invariant. So that's the that's the picture. Um, I think I described, or if I didn't, maybe it's useful just to describe it again, whether or not I described it the first time. So for just the surface of a sphere, we have a point on a sphere. We change the coordinates on the uh, our, our dx's for the case of the sphere are d theta and d phi. We um, take the partial of the point with respect to theta or phi, and we get how the point changes. And um, the way the point changes when you change theta, that's the direction, the vector e theta, and this is the vector e phi. And this is the sort of stuff that you learned in um, basic uh, mechanics or electrodynamics. Um, and then if you take what, what they don't then do in those courses is say, well, take the dot products of these vectors with themselves. Uh, they turn out to be uh, orthogonal and um, you get uh, the metric of the sphere. Um, you can do the same thing for a high, and that's a maximally symmetric space. You can do the same thing for the two-dimensional surface called a hyperboloid, there, um, if we want it to be maximally symmetric, then we embed it in a semi-Euclidean space-time with one time and two space dimensions. If we do three space dimensions, which is the natural thing to do, we get a, the standard hyperboloid um, we, or, which is either looks like that or it looks like this. Um, and uh, these are not maximally symmetric. As you can see, there's nothing particularly symmetric about the hyperboloid because the z direction is obviously different from the xy directions. And the same thing for the hyperboloid that looks like that. Um, on the other hand, if we take this as the equation relating x, y, and z, and use this as the metric, um, and say that the points are given by this. Now, these points satisfy this equation, uh, because cos squared minus sin squared is 1. And then we just go through the same razzmatazz, the partial of the point with respect to theta, it's this, partial of point with respect to phi, it's the tangent vector e phi, they look like this. They turn out to be orthonormal, excuse me, orthonormal. And the metric for the hyperboloid then is this. And um, it is maximally symmetric, but if you embed it in ordinary space, uh, it's not maximally symmetric. Um, the quotient theorem basically is if um, you have something that transforms properly when dotted into a tensor, then um, you can argue that it's a tensor. And um, uh, the, the, the metric of space-time, by the way, is non-singular because um, uh, obviously when we change the coordinates, the point on the space, on the curve space-time moves. Um, and uh, consequently, you never get that um, 
G I K D X K is never zero unless all the D X K is zero. And, and so that means that G is non-singular. And so it has an inverse and there is, that's its, in, its inverse is the, the inverse of the metric tensor. And um, you can then argue that that is a second rank contravariant tensor. Um, and um, we then use the metric tensor um, to raise and lower indexes or indices. And um, uh, so in particular, this sum of, or let, let's go, let's go down to this simple case in which we have already uh, just the ordinary metric tensor. So if we have a contravariant vector, we dot it into the uh, metric tensor, we obviously get a tensor that's uh, rank one covariant. The point though is that um, if we had used a different tensor, we'd get we'd also get a different co. If we dotted a, the contravariant vector AI into a rank two covariant any rank two covariant tensor, we would get a rank one uh, covariant vector that's somehow related to the contravariant vector a a a that we started with. But if we use as the second rank two covariant tensor, the metric tensor, then we get the covariant vector associated with the contravariant vector AI. And similarly, we have a covariant vector and we um, multiply it by the inverse of the metric tensor, we get a contravariant vector and it is the contravariant vector associated with the covariant vector AK. And this is called raising and lowering indexes or indices. And um, it applies throughout general relativity for any tensor, you raise or lower any index using um, the inverse metric tensor to raise and the metric tensor to lower, okay. In particular, you can take a tangent vector and raise it to be a co cotangent vector using the inverse of the metric tensor. And then the cotangent vectors and the tangent vectors are orthonormal. Um, and if you take a cotangent vector and lower it, you get a tangent vector. And the inner product of two tangent vectors, of course, is the metric tensor. The inner product of two cotangent vectors is the inverse of the metric tensor. And um, what's a little bit, um, what's, what's kind of important is um, the outer products of a cotangent vector with a tangent vector. And it doesn't matter when you write these outer products, at least if we're talking about ordinary complex numbers, as opposed to operators or Grassmann numbers. Um, it doesn't matter how you write them. And so let me just emphasize that. Um, suppose we have um, the vector E1 is AB and the vector say E2 is, um, um, so let me, yes, E2 is, let us say uh, CD. I'm doing this in a, um, uh, well, I, I I wrote them here in a way that's uh, kind of actually dopey. Um, let me instead write E1 as 1, 0, and E2 as 0, 1. Then E1, E1, in the sense of the outer product of E1 with E1, and... When I wrote the book, even the second edition, I didn't realize that there was an outer product notation that um, is, um, it's, the, it's this thing that in LaTeX is called backslash O times. And uh, when you write it, it's just an X with a circle. Anyway, E1 with E1, well, what is it? E1 is um, one zero and the other one is one zero. And so this is one zero zero zero. E2 with E2 is zero one zero one. 
and this is uh, 0, 0, 0, 1. And um, so EK, EK, or equivalently EK, explicit outer product EK is 1, 0, 0, 1. And this, of course, is the identity matrix. So this is the two by two illustration of this in the uh, four by four case, um, or in actually it's not four by four, it's that K run, I and K run, over, run from one to four, but the vectors I and K are longer than that because they're in the embedding space as opposed to the, um, as opposed to the, uh, uh, ordinary four-dimensional curved space-time of our coordinates. Um, and the sense in which it's the identity here is that it's that this thing is the identity operator when acting on the tangent vectors or when acting on the cotangent vectors. So in other words, EK cross or EK outer product EK dotted into EI gives you EI. And uh, this thing can be written either way. So if you write it this way, this is, well, this thing is obviously del the chronic of delta. And so it just gives you EK. Um, all right. I, I, now, now um, something that, I really meant to say today and should have said a couple of lectures ago is I, I skipped this section um, because, because I thought when I was preparing my lectures, I thought, well, this is just notation about Christoffel symbols and I should skip it. Well, no, I shouldn't have skipped it because this um, was an important section. So let me go through this section, um, which in, in the new version of the online notes is um, occurs here, it's 11.6. And so what I do first is define the Christoffel symbol of the first kind, gamma nil as en dot ei, uh, comma L. So this is e the nth tangent vector dotted into the ith the lth derivative of the ith tangent vector, and the dotting is with this internal metric. And um, I, we had more letters in the English alphabet. And I wouldn't have to use Greek, but I try to avoid Greek as much as possible. But uh, sometimes it's inescapable. Um, I don't have anything against Greek, by the way. In fact, when I was in high school, I suffered through three years of Greek, uh, which, of course, was a complete waste of time or a nearly complete waste of energy. But um, uh, never mind that. Anyway. Notice that EI is the derivative of the point with respect to the coordinate XI. If you differentiate that a second time with respect to XL, you get this structure here. But that's the same thing as differentiating the point twice, but in opposite order. And that would then be the ith derivative of EL. So these... these um, the derivatives of the tangent vectors um, form a symmetric matrix. That is, the lth derivative of the ith tangent vectors is a tangent vector is the same as the ith derivative of the lth tangent vector. Then, if you look at this definition here, you see that since you can switch L and I and not change anything, that means that the Christoffel symbol of the first kind is. Um, symmetric with respect to its last two indices or indexes. And in fact, um, we'll see in a moment that that's also true for the Christoffel symbol of the second kind, which is just the Christoffel symbol of the first kind with the index n raised. Um, and you might well, let me first of all mention the Christoffel symbols are not tensors. Um, 
just as the electrum, they're more like the electromagnetic field, which is not a tensor. On the other hand, the anti-symmetric derivatives of the electromagnetic field are the tensors, which we call the electric and magnetic fields. Same is true for the fields of the standard model. The gluon field is not a tensor. The W field is not a tensor. The Z field is not a tensor. But their anti-symmetric derivatives are tensors. Okay, anyway, so the Christoffel symbol of the first kind is symmetric in its last two indexes. And um, consequently, you can write it in a way that's explicitly symmetric. Um, on the other hand, the metric is an inner product of En with Ei. And uh, En with El gives you GNL. And so consequently, we can write this, uh, these dot products as, or I'm sorry, the derivatives of these dot products then are related to each other through the derivative of the metric tensor. In other words, the, what is being said here simply is that G N I comma L is E N dot E I comma L. And so this is E N comma L dot E I plus E N dot E I comma L. And um, so that's what that's what I wrote here, and you can do the same thing over here with um, N and L, with N, L, and I just playing different roles. And when you take these two expressions and substitute in here, you get something that's it looks silly. It's um, it's a more complicated expression for the Christoffel symbol of the first kind. But um, often in mathematics, to go forward, you have to take one, two, or three, or sometimes four or five steps backwards, and then finally you leap ahead. Um, so here what we've done is we have this nice simple definition. We, we, we write it in a way that makes its symmetry obvious. We then use, you know, we express these dot products in terms of the metric derivatives of the metric tensor, and we have something that looks like this. Uh, on the other hand, since the E's, the en, en comma L is El comma N, and so forth, the N comma I is the I comma N, and the metric tensor is the dot product of two tangent vectors, we can rewrite this as this, and now, this last thing you see is just um, EI dot EL, the nth derivative of EI dot EL, but that's the nth derivative of GIL. So this, um, as I said, we've taken several steps backwards. The advantage, however, is that we've now expressed the Christoffel symbol of the first kind just in terms of the metric tensor without any reference to the embedding space. And so that's um, an advantage because we don't really know what the embedding space is. We just are using the embedding space to understand general relativity. The Christoffel symbol of the second kind is the Christoffel symbol of the first kind with the index N raised. And I should have put raised in quotes because um, remember the Christoffel symbol isn't a tensor. So raising an index um, using the inverse of the metric tensor um, has real, ha has a deeper meaning when it's acting on a tensor. Here, it's just a product. Anyway, that's what the Christoffel symbol of the second kind is defined as being. It's G K N on gamma nil. And that, since we have a formula for gamma nil, this gives us a formula for the Christoffel symbol of the second kind in terms of the inverse of the metric tensor and then derivatives of the various derivatives of the metric tensor. Uh, we can also write it in these different ways. And, um, and in fact, one of the 
uh, simplest ways of writing it is to write it just like this. And now I'm wondering, um, uh, right, you see here, in other words, the original definition, so let me switch maybe to red, was gamma nil was equal to, let us say, en dot ei comma l. Well, if we then take, we then say get it gamma k i l is g k n e n dot e i comma l. Well, this this thing here makes perfect sense because the e n is a co is a cotangent vector, and so this I'm sorry is a tangent vector, and so this is just the cotangent vector dotted into uh, e i comma l. And um, that is what I've written here. Um, so I should have referred back to that original formula. Anyway, this is called the Levi Civita connection. Um, and the reason why it's associated with his name, well, of course, is that he emphasized it quite correctly, um, but various people wanting to um, be like Einstein have played with general relativity and generalized it and um, introduced um, things that play the role of the Christoffel symbols and um, this more general class of objects is called uh, an affine connection. Um, and uh, there are well, it was an infinite class of them, actually. Um, but the in this course and in standard relativity, uh, this gamma K I L is always written like this. In other words, this is the equation. This is what everybody means in standard relativity. And um, if we talk about an embedding space, then this is what it means in an embedding space in standard relativity. Um, no, I think it'd be absurd to consider different kinds of relativity in this course. Um, so um, I think it's probably useful to go through this again, although you may be, this may be the fourth or fifth time that I've dragged you through this. Um, so we want to make a covariant derivative of a contravariant vector. We first make a scalar by using the tangent vectors. We then differentiate. And then this gives us, since V is a scalar and this is a derivative, this is a covariant vector. But now to get it down, in, uh, to get it expressed just in terms of things that don't refer to the embedding space, we take a dot product with a cotangent vector. The cotangent vector with the tangent vector is just a uh, Parnica delta. And then the cotangent vector dotted into the derivative of the tangent vector, well, that's a Christoffel symbol. And so we get down to this expression. So this is where it comes from. This is where the, um, uh, why we have the, uh, why the Christoffel symbol occurs here. Um, I think it, I think it's better to first introduce the Christoffel symbol, and so so now you you can think of the Christoffel symbol either as in terms of embedding space quantities, or you can think of it just uh, as here as in terms of the inverse metric tensor and derivatives of the metric tensor. Um, as I said, the the, there are various notations, capital DL on VK or VK semicolon L. But in any case, it's always, it always is uh, this in, uh, well, in any form of general relativity, even bizarre forms, it's always this. But what gamma is varies in according to the, what kind you're talking about. Um, the derivative of the chronica delta obviously is zero. That's a dot product of a cotangent vector with a tangent vector. And so we get uh, a relation that's 
um, useful, uh, will be useful, namely that EI dot EL comma EK comma L is the same as EK dot, well, no, it's the negative of EK dot EI comma L. Um, so this in itself is an, a useful identity, but you can then use it together with the fact that the outer products of tangent and cotangent vectors are um, the identity operator or the identity matrix. Um, and uh, this is the identity matrix in the embedding space. Um, they imply that the covariant derivatives of cotangent vectors vanish. And the idea here is that the covariant vector of a cotangent vector is this expression here. And um, uh, wh what I've done here is use this relation to replace this with minus that. And then, and the, and the reason for that is to get an EI here. And um, this is actually the outer product of EI EI, cot EI tangent with EI cotangent, but that's the identity matrix in the um, uh, embedding space. And consequently, uh, you just get zero. So the bottom line then is that this is this nice identity that the sum of these two is zero and that the covariant derivative of cotangent vector vanishes. So what about covariant derivatives of covariant vectors? Well, you make a scalar by dotting it with cotangent vectors. You take the derivative and then to get, uh, to get rid of all reference to the embedding space, you take a dot product with a tangent vector. That gives you a chronica delta here and that gives you uh, an expression that we can recognize as um, a uh, Christoffel symbol. And so we have that the cover, the Elth covariant derivative of the ith component of a covariant vector is V is the Elth derivative of the ith component minus the Christoffel symbol of the first, of the second kind uh, dotted into the ve uh, ve covariant vector itself. Um, this transforms, of course, as a second rank covariant tensor. In fact, the whole point of these Christoffel symbols and of these covariant derivatives is to get derivatives that, trans that are tensors. Um, the covariant derivative of a tangent vector also vanishes. And the reason here is that um, uh, using this formula here, we want this structure right away. And so we have this structure here. Um, uh, well, anyway, it, it comes with an EK out of product EK and that gives you zero. Um, I, right, the, uh, this is clearer if you write it without the O tangent without this um, explicit cross product symbol, because then this lower EK is just VK and the upper EK is that. And so this is exactly this with V replaced by E. But um, if you then realize that this thing here is actually a tangent vector and this is a, an outer product, then you see you get zero. So the cotangent the covariant derivative of the tangent vector also vanishes. And remember, co uh, tenses transform like products of vectors. Um, the covariant derivative of two vectors is clearly um, something like this. Um, the covariant derivative of the one uh, plus the other, the first times the covariant derivative of the second. And um, that then is of this form. And this then defines, this rule defines how any uh, rank two contravariant tensor transforms. And um, so all of the, all the tensors transform this, uh, uh, 
they transform the covariant derivatives of all the trans of all the tensors transform as if the tensors were products of vectors and using the natural using Leibniz's rule to uh, to form the derivatives. So in particular, you get if it's a rank two covariant tensor, you get two Christoffel symbols because it's because they're covariant, you get two minus signs. Now, one of the important things is that the covariant derivative of the metric tensor vanishes. And um, so according to this formula, it's these two gamma uh, functions. And um, one can show this explicitly. Um, and in fact, that would be a very nice exercise. Um, I am not sure how long it would take to actually do it. You see, we have formulas for the Christoffel symbols in terms of derivatives of the metric tensor. And so if we express this one that way and this one that way, then we're going to get zero. But um, how much algebra is involved, I don't know. Um, I've never done it that way. Instead, the way I looked at it was the metric tensors, the dot product of two vectors, and so there, and the, and so the rule then is the covariant derivative of the dot product is the covariant derivative of the one times the other plus the first times the covariant derivative of the second. But these guys have zero covariant derivatives, so you altogether get zero. So that's the way I did it. But as I said, you can just chug through this, but it often happens that. Um, when you start chugging in general relativity, uh, you you can get an awful lot of indices, and um, things can get um, confusing and lengthy, boring. Anyway, covariant curls. Um, as I said, the uh, because of the symmetry on these last two indices, the the anti-symmetrized covariant derivative of a covariant vector uh, has two terms, uh, has four terms, but two of them cancel. And so it's just the ordinary quarrel. And that's why, that's why the electric and magnetic fields are anti-symmetric um, derivatives of the electromagnetic field. The anti-symmetry there is necessary to make them generally covariant. And why are they generally covariant? Well, anything, as I said, physics should be written entirely in terms of tensors. And um, and uh, and the spinner analogs. And um, consequently, uh, one would have to anti-symmetrize uh, the vectors, the electromagnetic field. This this thing is the thing we call a mu, if you use Greek, and um, it's you know it's the scalar potential, and then the vector potential to make a four vector. Um, this anti-symmetry is just um, it, it's 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 unnatural because it involves minus signs, and the human brain was not designed. We did not evolve with minus signs, and we. We learned that there was one apple, and we saw two apples, and we could distinguish two apples from three apples, and that was important. And so we learned, so addition became an essential part of our brains. But in the jungle, we didn't find minus two apples and then three apples over here. And by combining them, we saw that we had actually one apple. Um, uh, so minus signs are confusing, but um, anti-symmetry is extremely useful, and uh, even though it's unfamiliar. So if you take the covariant derivative of a rank, of a covariant rank two tensor, you get something with two Christoffel symbols of the second kind. But if it's anti-symmetric, and you add the you add three of these covariant derivatives together, 
in a way that's cyclically symmetric. So in other words, ILK, uh, KIL, LKI, you add them together and all these guys cancel, these six terms cancel. And this is named after Bianchi or Bianchi, I don't know how to pronounce it. Someone Italian could tell me, Bianchi probably. Anyway, the Maxwell field strength tensor is anti-symmetric by construction and the, the homogeneous Maxwell equations then are, uh, they're normally written this way with single derivatives but uh, in fact, with single derivatives, they are the same thing. That we could replace the single derivatives with covariant derivatives. I'm sorry, we could replace the ordinary derivatives with covariant derivatives. And then we'd see that this thing is um, a, a, a uh, rank three covariant tensor. And so this is a tensor equation valid in all coordinate systems. And so that's interesting how um, uh, how this um, mathematical, the right mathematics appeared 150 years ago when, when uh, uh, Maxwell and Faraday discovered it because what they discovered had to be a tensor equation because that's what's true. Um, parallel transport is the movement of a vector along a curve in such a way that the length and direction in successive tangent spaces don't change. Of course, I use that phrase tangent space. So the idea here is that we've got some, some surface might look like that. And um, then at a particular point here, uh, there's a plane tangent to that surface. And so that plane would be something that would look kind of like that. And um, it would um, be given by a tangent vector this way, a tangent vector that way. It would be spanned by all the tangent vectors. And how many are there? There were four, because the tangent vectors are the derivatives with respect to each of the coordinates of our uh, of our four dimensional space. Um, that's because that's if we're doing general relativity. If instead we're talking about uh, furniture, then um, we might just use three derivatives, um, uh, or even two derivatives if we're talking about the surface of a sphere. Anyway. Um, so the idea is that um, the vector changes um, and uh, as you change it, um, in other words, it's V comma L dx L, but the projection of the change into the chain tangent space must vanish. So the, the, there's the change. And if you dot that change into the, the the uh, the projection operator onto the tangent space you get zero. Well, it's easier to write this mathematically than to talk about it abstractly. And here, the if we write it in terms of if we write the vector in terms of contravariant components and and tangent vectors, then the the equation is that the change in the vector, which is V comma L dx L dotted into the cotangent vectors, we want that to vanish. And um, uh, so maybe I should go through this step by step. Um, this V of course is V K E K and its elf derivative then looks like that. Now, if we take the derivative of this, we get, um, if the derivative acts on the V, we get this. If it acts on the E, we get that. Now the dot product through here, this EI dot EK is just a Kronecker delta. EI dot EK comma L, that's a Christoffel symbol. 
So it's these two, and and the Kronika delta just makes this simple, uh, makes this term more simple. And this thing is just the Christoffel symbol of the second kind. And so this is the equation of, of parallel transport. It's that um, the, the, cover, the, the, the vector has to change as we move it along a line DXL. It has to change in such a way that its covariant derivative vanishes at every point there. And um, in terms of covariant components, um, you then have that the covariant, der the covariant derivative of the covariant components of the vector times dxl vanishes. And um, so if the curve is xl of u, then what we have is that d vi du, um, which is vi comma l dxl du, has to be this so that the cover so that the covariant derivative vanishes and over here the same thing in other words the the reason for this equation is that if if that equation is true in other words vi comma l dx l du equals minus gamma i k l dxl du then that's the same thing as vi comma l plus gamma i kl dxl du equals zero and this is um dl of vi dxl du equals zero so this is the so this, th this is what we started out as the condition of parallel transport. And now we see we can rewrite it uh, that way. Or equivalently, we can rewrite it this way if we use this expression. And um, as I said to you uh, last time, if we have a sphere, and we take a vector that is pointing in the phi direction. Let's use red this time. So it's pointing this way and we pull it up here. It turns out to look like this. Now it looks like a theta uh, uh, vector. And so as we bring it down, it looks this way. And then as we bring it across, it just, so we see that it's written, it's rotated by 90 degrees. You might wonder why is it that, that the phi vector turned into a theta vector? Well, if we look here at the North Pole, then the, the, longitude zero, which is what defines the x-axis, and the longitude 90, I don't know, I mean, this is in my way of doing the sphere, is the North Pole, and we go down here. Okay, so um, what, what we were doing was we were bringing a vector up, let me write the vector now in blue, you see, it was bring, being brought up this way. And at the North Pole, indeed, if we then go back down the North Pole, it just looks like this. And so, so really all the action is taking place um, uh, kind of at the North Pole, actually. Um, because then um, going up the um, the line of zero longitude and then going down the line of 90 degree longitude, um, those are um, pretty obvious. And then moving it around the um, equator, if we go down to the equator, 
then what we're seeing is um, if say this is the line of uh, zero, so that's phi equals zero, and this is the line phi equals pi over two, then um, what we're seeing here was um, the original vector uh, looked like that, and the vector here looks like this. And so um, from the viewpoint of the equator, it looked like this. And then we then move it across and get something that's perfect. That's so this shows us that the this is a mathematical way of thinking about the um, the uh, sphere as being a curved surface. Um, so now, what's 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 clear then, uh, or intuitively, is that. Um, Curvature then is how much a vector changes when it's being parallel transported or parallelly transported um, along a surface. And um, here we had a nice surface, uh, the surface of a sphere, it's maximally symmetric. And um, by the way, there were three maximally symmetric spaces of dimension two. One is the sphere. The second is the plane. And the third is that hyperboloid in a uh, space, embedded in a space time with one, uh, three dimensions with one time component. Um, or one negative sign. I don't know if we have to call that a time component. Um, so the condition that we've just uh, derived here for, well, actually it was just, I just wrote it down. There's the condition um, for parallel transport and, um, uh, or equivalently the condition is that, that uh, the condition is that the change in the vector as you move it around is given by minus a Christoffel symbol. And um, if we forget about the minus sign for the moment, um, and uh, or if we use the other equation, uh, we use this equation, then we actually have a plus sign. Yeah, since we're using a covariant vector, we want to have the plus sign. So um, that's because the derivative, covariant derivative, of covariant vector has the minus sign. So then we flip it to the other side, it becomes a plus sign. So the change in the covariant vector, if we move it, if we parallel transport it around a point, um, and come back and uh, we go around and we're going to go around in a tiny square and the tiny square is going to be um where in other words we've got this point say x zero and we're going to go this way and then this way and then that way and then that way and um we integrate then the christoffel symbol of the second kind like that. Um, and it's not going to matter what the VKs are. What matters is what the integral of the Christoffel symbol is. And so what we do is we write the Christoffel symbol as its value at the center plus its derivatives times the distance from the center. So in other words, we're at a little point here or a little point there and it's, and we, we, go around in this blue way. Um, the, the vector itself is going to be the vector at the center plus the derivatives times the displacement from the center. And 
The idea then of parallel transport is that VK is just this gamma thing. In other words, it was, let's see if I can, if I can. Well, I wrote it two ways. All right, it's, it's essential, it's, we're gonna use this equation. So dVi du is gamma k i l v k d x l du. So this is what we're using, and um, uh, well, let me get back to it. So in other words, the the if we have parallel transport, then the L derivative of vi is gamma times the v k dotted in. Anyway, it's so this is equal to that. And we are gonna evaluate them both at the uh, at x zero and then just have this uh, uh, distance here. Um, so uh, if we then take the, we take this expression and stick it there, we take this expression and stick it there, then we integrate dl and then we throw away anything that's second order in x minus x zero. And what we're left with then is this plus that uh, times the integral of x minus x zero nth component, not nth power, nth component, nth contravariant component, dxl. And um, what does that then uh, give us? Well, this integral here is uh, a squared times, um, maybe I should just explain that just a little bit. What is, what is going on? Why do they all of a sudden, this, these Apple products have minds of their own um, and they, they have free will um, built into them. So an integral of um, x minus x zero nth component dxl. Well, this is a distance a. So, um, it um, one way of thinking about it is clearly it's minus x zero nth component times an integral dxl, and then it's plus this integral of x dx x n dxl. And um, this term here, which is to say this term, this is gonna be zero. And so we just have this term. And so then, um, so let me show you what this is. Suppose we have, whoa, what is that? So let me go back here. So suppose we have an integral x1 dx2. Well, if we're changing x2 and not x1, then x1, what is x1? x1 is something like, suppose, suppose we're talking about this as the two direction. And um, what's x1? x1 is what, it, what is the coordinate, what is the first coordinate if we are on the, uh, well, it is whatever it is. So that's x1 and then dx2 is just a. And what is x1? Well, um, Actually, I would have been better off. Let, let me say x1 minus x0 
one. Then this is going to be x one minus x zero one. And that is going to be something like if the point is say down here, then this is going to be minus a over two times a. And similarly, if you do all the others, um, uh, what you wind up with is a squared times um, uh, plus or minus one, which is what epsilon nl is. And um, this, um, so you get a squared times plus or minus uh, one. Um, you might say, why is it that uh, uh, that if n equals l, you get zero? Well, that's because if you have an integral of, let us say, whoa, say x minus a half dx from zero to a, well, this is going to give us a squared over two minus um, why am I getting something that's not zero? Um, minus. Uh, oh, it's minus a over two. Okay, so that's why um, you have e. Uh, why it's zero if n equals l, and if it's if n is not equal to l, then it's a squared, and then it's all the overall sign depending on whether you're going clockwise or counterclockwise, and what you mean by positive area and so forth. Anyway, that's all not a, none of that's important. The important thing is that um, the change in VI then is basically a squared and this epsilon NL. And so that means that what, what we're going to get is this VK um, times this gamma, this product of gammas and this gamma this derivative of the gamma uh, written um, in a uh, in ln with one sign and then you subtract for the ln case. And so that's, that's why you have nl minus ln, ln minus nl. And um, so it's, so this follows directly from that, but with some uh, algebra and um, or just identifying the coefficients correctly. And then um, what do we have? The thing inside the brackets then is Riemann's curvature tensor. So that's where this comes from. That's why the Riemann curvature tensor is this. And um, what you've got then is by construction, something that's anti-symmetric in the last two indices because and that came from this structure here. Um, and then it has a it has several other symmetries. I forget how many symmetries it has. And um, I I don't think we need to go through all of this detail. Um, but um, well, all right. I've got some things that I refer to that are way in the end of chapter 13. Um, but the main thing is that um, the symmetries that we have um, reduce, first of all, if you, if you want to analyze, make something, if you want to take advantage of symmetry, you can have some indices up and some indices down. You got to have them all up or them all down. When you put them all down, then um, the, the the 256 components of um, R, I, J, K, L uh, reduced to 20. So there are 20 components. Um, 
the Ricci tensor. So then if you raise the, the first component and set it equal to the third component and sum, you get the Ricci tensor. And then if you take the Ricci tensor and um, raise one component and sum, you get the curvature sense uh, scalar. This is sometimes called the Riemann scalar. Um, and by the way, just to show you how close we are to essentially understanding everything about general relativity is that the action of general relativity, the Einstein-Hilbert action for gravity as opposed to for the mass matter fields, but the action just of gravity is, I think it's something like eight pi g over, or eight g, uh, anyway, there's something in the denominator, I forget what it is. Then it's an integral of r square root of g d fourth x. g here is the absolute value of the determinant of g i k. So G I K is a four by four matrix. You take its determinant, take the absolute value of that determinant, take the square root. And why do you do that? Well, if you do that, then this becomes a scalar. And, and then what we've just seen is that we've taken a rank four covariant tensor, the curvature tensor and turned it into first a rank two covariant tensor, the Ricci tensor, and then a scalar, the Riemann scalar, and that is this uh, thing that we called um, R. And uh, so the action of general relativity is eight pi g over, let me guess that it's three. I don't really remember what it is. Um, so let me, I can look here for, there's Einstein's, oh, wait a minute, it's, phew, I was way off, it's not this. It is C cubed divided by 16 pi g, and then, the important part I did get right, square root of g d four x. Um, I think the the reason I thought it was eight pi g is that um, when you write Einstein's equations on the right hand side, you get an eight pi g. Um, and so, since I just mentioned Einstein's equations, um, right? Okay, so. Um, so Einstein's equations, let's see, let's, let's write them in blue. R I K, uh, minus a half G I K R is equal to eight pi G. Ah, it's not over three. It's over C to the fourth T I K where this is the um, energy momentum tensor. Of the matter fields, and frankly, um, you know, we have two mysteries that we do admit and talk about all the time, dark energy and dark matter, because we, those are like the elephant, two elephants in the room, or an elephant and a giraffe in the room. Um, so we can't ignore them. But there are a gazillion other things we don't understand. What is spin? Um, what, um, wh why is it that all the matter fields uh, are, spin one half fields and um, why do they well I guess the fact that we sort of understand why they interact via um, uh, spin one fields um, that's because um, uh, 
if we want to have maximum symmetry, then we um, have um, have to have covariant derivatives um, uh, of the uh, of the matter fields and um, covariant is this. See what. what what these covariant, I've been describing these covariant derivatives as, well, we are out of time. Um, I've been describing the covariant derivatives as things that make derivatives tensors. So the covariant derivatives of vectors or tensors um, uh, are then uh, themselves tensors and vectors. Well, in ordinary particle physics or in the standard model, you have derivatives of um, uh, spinner fields, the fields that describe the fermions. And um, you then want th these derivatives to be tensors in the sense of, they, you want them to transform simply kind of like tensors in the sense of when you rotate, when you do the symmetry transformations of the standard model, which is to say, you rotate the strongly interacting fields into each other, quarks, the red and green and blue quarks into each other, and you and you rotate the the Ws and the Zs into each other, and so forth. So that's that's basic. Or you rotate electrons into neutrinos, and red and green quarks into each other, and so forth. All right. Well. Um, I'll end now and um, tomorrow, and I'll put these new things uh, tonight on the class website. Um, and uh, I'll see you tomorrow at at five thirty. We will be holding class. I will be holding class at five thirty tomorrow, even though it's Wednesday because Wednesday is a full service day at UNM. Um, but then Thursday and Friday are. Um, holidays and uh, we'll have class. Um, I'll have office hours four to six on Monday and then um, we'll have a class on Tuesday at 5 30. Okay, well, that's enough. I'm going to then, I don't see any questions there. I'm going to um, stop sharing and um, end and end.